Okay, everyone, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed your lunch break. Now, let me hand over to uh, Ziv Nahadinam again. Um, I'd also like to say a bit of a special thanks to Ziv. Um, he is the person who coordinates our podcast, right, and all the YouTube. Um, we all jump on it, we all just talk, and then we jump off, and Ziv is the one who puts everything together and uploads it and manages and all of that, so I think, <laughs> but still it gets done, versus if it were me, like, nothing would get done. So I do want to extend a, a, a sincere thank you for getting that done, um, and I know a lot of you are here through the podcast, through what you've seen on socials, and a big part of that is uh, because of Ziv, so thank you so much. And now, over to, to Ziv. Thank you. Um, so we had the interesting and the beautiful stuff up until now. Now I'm going to bore the shit out of you. So I apologize in advance. Um, so just a super quick intro. Um, you know, all of the speakers are in different areas of real estate. We basically at NTI uh, do everything else. So we represent people uh, living in Japan or out of Japan, help them purchase, uh, mainly in the locations in Japan that are a bit more challenging for English speakers. So. We help people, a lot of what we do is help people invest in real estate in Japan, which is the topic of today's presentation. I didn't want to get too deeply into um, selection criteria and locations and population figures. We'll touch on that briefly. But I, what I wanted to do today is just give you a, a really nitty gritty breakdown of what we actually do when we're looking for and then evaluating investment property deals in Japan. So we're going to do it um, in two segments to kind of meld into each other. Um, affordable, cheaper, uh, kubomancho, one room type units in condominium, which are usually the, one of the two most popular asset classes. And then for people who have a bit more of a budget, uh, itobi, so small buildings, two or three floors, usually wooden structures with up to, say, 12 or 15 units. Okay, so how do we find investment properties? So basically, if you're already in touch with real estate agents, especially the more um, responsive and proactive type, um, and actually I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce Madame Giman over there, Mika Giman. Could you please stand up for a second? So Mika is one of the agents that we work with. She's based here in Tokyo, but she's one of the unique agents who will actually help you research properties all over the country when you're looking for them. So it, it's rare, but if you do happen to, thank you, Mika, you can sit down. <laughs> if you do happen to have one of these agents on hand, um, they're extremely useful. And once you've got a relationship with them and they know your criteria, they know what you're looking for, then they will send you emails and PDFs with properties that might suit and you can help by fine tuning their research. And it's great. But otherwise, if you're doing it on your own, so you're probably familiar, especially if you're living here in Japan, you're familiar with the regular real estate websites that most people use to look for homes. So Sumo Homes, uh, Nifty Homes, uh, like Lifula, the rest of them. There are two particular websites, and you can find investment properties on these general uh, multi-listing websites. But there's a bit of scrolling and looking for information involved. There are two websites that are particularly geared towards investment properties, which are the ones that we normally use if we don't have anything from agents that we work with. We just go there and research. So one of them is kenbia.com, and the other one is Rakumachi. And the big advantage, and you'll see it when we drill down into the actual research, is that they actually pull out all of the financial data, all of the numbers together in one centralized location, so it's very easy to then find the data that you're looking for. If you're looking at homes or a small, you have to scroll up and down. Some of them don't even list things like um, kumiai, like um, uh, monthly building fees and so forth, and then you have to ask the agents to provide that information. It becomes a bit of a pain in the bum. Rakomachi and Kenbia will list all of the information for you. So those are usually the two best websites to look for investment properties. That's the ones, th those are the ones that we use anyway. And then, going to go up. Okay, so I'm going to be switching between um, the original Japanese pages and translations to English at various points throughout the slides. If you're comfortable with kanji and your, your own... Thank you, Siri. Um, if you're not comfortable with kanji, um, I use uh, Edge Explorer. I just right-click and go translate to English. Google has its own thing. Firefox has its own thing. You can get translations. They're obviously not super accurate, but for research purposes, they'll usually do. So 
If you are particularly interested in a particular region, um, you can select them uh, from the drop-down list here. Again, I'm not going to focus on why we would particularly choose one location over another, except briefly, but there is that option. And then the next thing you do is specify a very wide price bracket. You will be able to fine-tune that uh, a little bit later. And then when you get results, so in this case we're looking for um, Kubo Mansion, condo units, one room, as they call them here, even though they could be three or four bedrooms. Um, and obviously there are a lot of them, even in that relatively small price range. But then we start drilling down and we mark things like, because for mansion units, you're usually looking at reinforced concrete blocks. So uh, Blanca was mentioning before about, you know, uh, properties definitely start deteriorating after 20 years. Not so much the case with the reinforced concrete blocks. We usually prefer to go for 30 years or younger um, for other reasons, more related to building fees and the potential for buy by developers and so forth. But generally anything 30 years and younger is going to be in reasonable shape. At least the structure is going to be in reasonable shapes within 10 minutes from uh, Station, obviously if you're in a city where there's only trams or buses, that's going to be different, but those are usually not the best investment destinations anyway. So you really want to stay within 10 minutes to a train station, and um, we can talk about um, leasehold versus freehold. There's not that much leasehold in Japan, but we usually just go for um, outright ownership of the property. So we start drilling down by this criteria. We still have 864 properties. This is a search that I've done last week. But when we start drilling down um, through interest, as they call it here, which is basically rental yield, um, that's when the really interesting thing happens, and we're down to six properties all of a sudden. Right? And I've chosen here 8% or more. In a minute, I'll show you why I'm going for such high yield. Um, but basically, when I went up to 9%, for example, there wasn't even a single property found last week. I go down to 8%, I got six of them. We still don't know where they are, or we don't know where they are. And then I look at the locations, right? So I'm going to get a list of properties. Usually, if you go by this criteria, it's not going to be a huge list, maybe up to 20 or 25 properties at the busiest time of the year. The reason for that is because they're so affordable, they go very, very, very quickly. So many times they're going to be sold before they even hit the MLS websites. A lot of times they're going to go directly um, by email from agents to potential investors before they even upload them to the website. So the list is always going to be fairly limited, which makes it easy research-wise. And then what I do next is, because again, I'm ambivalent to location, I'm obviously, I care about location in the sense that I want to invest in a location that's going to be attractive, but whether the property is in Kobe or Yokohama or Fukuoka or Nagoya, those are all cities that are acceptable for me as an investor. Population numbers are okay, industry, economy numbers, uh, economy uh, scenario is okay. So I'm happy with those locations. I'm marking down um, Kobe, Kobe, obviously Tokyo, Chiba, as locations that I know and I'm comfortable with, and I'm circling locations that I'm going to get back to and investigate later, because I might know, not know these cities. Right? Obviously, there are a lot of cities in Japan that many people don't even know about, but they could be good investment destinations, so we'll look at them. And then, we analyze the deal. So, we open an Excel sheet, and the Excel sheet that I'm gonna show here is the one we use in-house. It's uh, available as a template to any of you. Just reach out and I'll send you a copy of that. And then we start putting the numbers in there. So we open the actual listing, we click on the link from the list, and I've highlighted here stuff that you want to put into your Excel sheet, and also stuff that you want to have a look at and consider. So the red, um, at the top right, we've got uh, Juichi Man Yen, so 110,000 yen per month in gross rental income. Down below that, we've got the building fees, so the one on the left is uh, management fee, the one on the right is uh, reserve funds, or as they call it here, accumulated funds, which is what goes towards the repair fund that the owner union and the building management company hold for renovations and um, repairs. And down here, these are countries that you really want to get familiar with. There's only two or three versions of that. This one means uh, owner in residence. So the property is occupied, but not by a tenant. The moment you buy it, the owner is likely to be moving out. Those are quite rare. Usually you'll see, we'll see that in a few other examples down the track, you'll usually see either occupied or vacant. And there are advantages and disadvantages to both for the simplest, smoothest kind of turnkey investments that generate income from day one, we usually go for tenanted properties. 
So this one, I'm going to take the numbers with a grain of salt because if the owner is living there, then this is clearly just an assumption, right? So this is the agent assuming that they can get 110,000 yen, and if they're not the best agent in the world, they might you know, skew those assumptions a bit higher. So there's always room for some uh, rent research of comparable properties before you actually buy a vacant one. And what I've marked there is just a point of interest. Um, the unit is on the first of seventh floors. If the building is secure and there's no access from the street to the balconies and windows, that's usually not an issue. But if it is kind of smaller building that might, you know, people could just pass and have a peek inside, single females will avoid these kinds of units. So you're reducing your potential tenant base. If you go for a first floor unit, in Japan, first floor means ground floor. If you go for a first floor unit in a building that is readily accessible from the street, you're probably going to lose out on most of the single female potential tenants that you have there. So that's just something to look out. And I've put a big lightning bolt on this because I'll show you in a second why. So we start punching the numbers into Excel. All I've put here is the purchase price and the rental price, and then I get exactly the same yield that the agent listed. And obviously that's complete bullshit because it doesn't factor in any of the purchase costs, any of the running costs, any of the agency fees, any of the building fees, nothing. So once we start adding in the numbers, and this is why I chose 8% to begin with, because if I'm looking at individual units in co-owned blocks, I'm always going to be assuming that the actual yield is going to be at least 3 to 4% lower than what they're actually advertised for. So that number is completely irrelevant to operations. It might be relevant from a tax perspective, but not from a cash and pocket monthly perspective. Because once we start adding in the numbers, purchase costs um, can vary. So the realtor fee is always fixed, 3% plus 60,000 yen plus tax. That's how it works out. Legal and registration fees, as well as the purchase tax that you'll be paying um, after the purchase, vary depending on the official evaluation of the property. Generally speaking, legal fees for these cheaper properties could be anywhere from 2-3% and all the way up to 5-6%. Purchase tax from 1.5% to 2.5%. So just by putting in these higher worst case numbers, we're already down by almost 1%, about 0 07 but the real fun begins when we put in the monthly building fees. Right, so that takes me down. My lovely 8.8% .8 return property is now actually 5.2% net pre-tax per annum. So just to make it clear what yield means when we talk about these things, yield means the percent of my initial total investment that I'm going to get back from the property every year. And that, as you can see below that percentage, that will take me about 20 years to pay off. Not to say that this is a bad investment, just explaining why we're searching for 8%, 7% and higher on these websites, because the reality is a lot lower than that. Okay. And then, when we start looking at each and every property. So the first one was in Kobe. We said, nice city, we're happy with that. The second one is in Kuwanashi, which I personally have never heard about until I've done this research last week. So what I went and did is, um, I've downloaded this I've downloaded the latest population census report, um, which is available on the Japanese uh, legal Bureau of, Bureau of Statistics. They publish a population census once every five years. I always check, the first thing I want to check, because Japan being Japan, population is um, conglomerating from um, outer cities and smaller towns into bigger metropolitan centers. What's actually happening with Kuwan City? We see that it lost about 1,600 people in the last five, not the last five years, between 2015 to 2020. It's also quite a small city, so 1,600 doesn't sound like much, but considering the entire population is less than 140,000, it's probably not a growing, kind of vibrant location from an investment perspective. It could be a wonderful place for tourism, to raise a family. From an investment perspective, I might find it very difficult to repopulate a vacant property if the tenant base is constantly shrinking. Right? So that's something to consider. And then I go down the list, we got Kobe again, let's see what's happening with this next Kobe property. Ah, oh, vacant. Right? So that's the second kanji that you want to familiar yourself, uh, familiarize yourself with. That means the property is vacant. There are advantages, disadvantages to that, but it's not going to be a turnkey income generating property from day one. So if that's something that you're okay with, you can proceed. But then again, just as a reminder, 
it's vacant, you want to do some market research and make sure it can actually get Nanaman yen, because that's often not going to be the case. So you look at comparable properties, similar size, similar area, similar year of build, and you just make sure that that's a valid assumption. It's usually going to be a bit less than that. Going down the list again, Tokyo. So that's the kanji for um, occupied, tenanted. And again, we look at the price, we look at the rental income per month. Now it's real rental income, the property is tenanted, so this is the actual rental income that we're receiving every month, assuming that the agent is not, occasionally they make mistakes and typos, so of course all of this you want to um, confirm with them when you're actually looking at property documentation, but assuming the rent amount is correct and assuming the building fees are correct, I'm also highlighting in yellow there the fact that this is a fourth floor property in a four-story small building, um, legally in Japan, property uh, buildings that are six floor or over must have an elevator. Five floors and lower don't have to have an elevator. They usually will. Four floors or three floors, you're getting into potentially no elevator territory. And if your unit is on the fourth floor without an elevator, then Jisan, Basan, single mamas carrying a lot of shopping or single kids uh, or, or little kids on their shoulders and so forth not going to be renting the property. So again, you're reducing your potential tenant base a fair bit, which means longer vacancies in between tenants. But all being said and done, Tokyo property for this price, this rent amount am I generating 4.3% net pre-tax return is not a bad deal. You're not going to get many of those in Tokyo. So we would probably in most cases be okay continuing with this one, even with the potential longer vacancies because of the fourth floor. And then the last on the list, Chiba City, quite happy with that, tenanted again. And we're noticing that there are 86 units in the building. I'll explain why I've highlighted that in a moment. We got the price, we got the rent, the property is tenanted. We're punching all of that in and we're getting about 5% net pre-tax, which again is quite, quite good for Chiba City. It'll usually be slightly lower than that. So we're happy with the returns. Checking the last property on the list, which is in Toride City. Again, similar numbers, not growing in population, so we're probably not gonna highlight, highlight that one as a potential attractive investment. So we're left with a few properties um, that we found, one in Tokyo, one in Chiba, and one in Kobe. And now I'll, I'll do, before I get into the actual due diligence related to each property, I'll just explain uh, how the process works when we're looking at entire buildings as opposed to single properties. So with entire buildings, it's important to note that there is no reserve fund being collected. You are the owner of the property. You have to put money aside for renovation and repairs. So we're searching um, similarly. So this, this one I took from Rakumachi. So the interface is a little bit different, but the data is all very similar. I've specified a price range that I'm happy with, minimum return. Now with buildings, there are no building fees, which make the biggest difference between the listed yield and the actual yield. So when I'm looking for buildings, I'm usually assuming that they're gonna be one or 2% under the listed yield, as opposed to the individual condo units, which we said is four or 5% under. So in this case, I've searched for 6%. Again, I'm just trying to get to about 4% return, which is usually where deals start looking interesting for our customers, at least. And when I look for a building, I, I further fine-tune the price. So I wanted something between um, 40 million yen to 70 million yen. And I got a bunch of buildings. So in this case, I got 561 potential properties. Obviously, they're more expensive, they take longer to sell, they stay on the market a little bit longer, but they're still very good investments for those who can afford them. So, I found... Oh, and with buildings, again, because they're wooden structures, I mark them as 20 years for the same reason that Blanca explained. Beyond 20 years, wooden structures start to deteriorate faster. Um, obviously, you're probably gonna be holding them past that point, but at least on purchase, we wanna try to make Give, us, give ourselves five or 10 years without these major renovation expenses, which will start accumulating after 20 years of age. So I got this one, 65,000 yen. Interest looks like 6.4, yield looks like 6.42. I 
here I've got the monthly rental again. The property is tenanted and this time they're also letting me know that it's fully tenanted. So all of these six units have got a tenant in them at the moment. I put that into Excel and I get about 5%. So 1% down on the listed price. With, with all of the purchase costs I factored in here, 10%. This is for somebody buying direct. Um, we can get into, in the Q&A panel if you want, we can get into how we calculate potential worst case purchase costs and all of that. But let's assume for now that it's not gonna be worse than 10% purchase costs. So that gives me about 5% and great return for, what was that, Chiba? Saitama, Saitama City. Great return for Saitama City, I'm happy with that. And then once we have shortlisted our final few properties is when, if the numbers make sense to us at that point, then we will go ahead and contact the listing agent and start receiving due diligence information. So the first thing we're going to do is to confirm that all of the data in the listing is actually backed up in official documents. Initially, it'll be by email or call with the agent, but eventually before signing, we're going to get the actual official legal documents and we're going to confirm all of the, the numbers, the year of bill, the tenant role, everything that they've shared with us. We want to confirm in official documents. And then we're going to get something like that. So we're going to get a tenant role. We want to make sure that we know how old the tenants are, when they moved in, if they have a guarantee company. There are various types of securities and a guarantee company being the best among them. And again, I'm gonna get very deeply into that now, but we can talk about that later. I'm also going to, so I don't have building fees, but I obviously do have monthly costs. So if it's a new fancy-ish building, it's going to be providing an internet connectivity to the tenants as part of the rent that they pay. There's going to be monthly cleaning, maybe some gardening, if there's some bushes or little trees around the property. Um, all of that information will be given by the agent. It's not, going to be, it's not going to be available on the public listings. We're going to have to contact the agents to get all of this information. We then punch that in. We're still at about 5% because I originally assumed... Oh, sorry, you can't see that. But I originally assumed about 20,000 yen in monthly costs, and that wasn't too far off. So we're not that far off on the yield. And then we look at the, and then, so, so for a building, this would be about it. You would normally not have a huge renovation history that you can get from sellers. If you're buying something 20 years and younger, they haven't done too many renovations, unless there was some um, weather damage to the roof or the exterior. But normally there's not gonna be any huge renovation history to look at for a building. But if you're buying a unit in a concrete block, then you definitely want to look, number one, at the renovation history for the entire structure. And number two, if they've got enough money in the reserve funds that they've collected from all of the unit owners. Because if they don't, they will definitely have to raise the monthly building fees before they can schedule a new renovation. And if the last renovation was over 10 years ago, so here we're kind of borderline, if the exterior and the the roof, okay, so we got the exterior walls and the roof. Those are the two biggest renovation items. There's also elevators, but they only need to happen every 20 years. Exterior and roof at a building that's 30 years or older is usually gonna happen every 15 or 20 years. So we look at the last 10 years of renovation history. We see if those two big items were done and we make sure that they've collected enough to get another big renovation done. So in this case, we're looking at uh, 26,000, 27,000 million yen collected in total, which works out if we divide it by the number of units and we're assuming a similar price for each unit, so that works out to be about 11.5% of the purchase price per unit or per unit owner. If the building hasn't been renovated in the last 10 years, we usually like to see a higher amount in the reserve fund, maybe 20, 30%, just to make sure that the owner union and the building management company do have enough money to pull off a big renovation. In this case, again, kind of borderline, 10 years ago the roof and the exterior was done, so we probably have at least another five or 10 years before they have to be done again, which probably means that building fees, those two, are not going to go too high in the foreseeable future. So I'm going to have maybe five, six, seven years at this return before the yield starts dropping, because as building fees go up, um, rental yield obviously drops. So that's what we do with individual units. And um, 
you will see as you start um, embark on this process of researching these properties on your own that it's very easy um, to just get paralyzed, right? Like, oh, there's three of them that look like kind of borderline good deals. One of them is a bit over the budget. I'm not sure what to do. So you do want to avoid this analysis paralysis. Eventually, you will have to pull the trigger on a property purchase if you want to get into investing. But it's definitely a good idea to maybe test yourself with a few cheaper properties before putting your entire budget into a bigger, more expensive one. Okay, so we, we call this to fire um, musket balls before firing cannonballs. Right? We, we want to invest so we get the experience, so we get comfortable, and we don't get paralyzed. But maybe don't put all of your budget into a single investment at a single go. Just give yourself the time to learn the process with cheaper properties because obviously, number one, you're going to make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes the first few times. Number two, not all investments perform equally. Some of them will be great on paper. After you purchase, some disaster happens, the yield drops, the tenant leaves, somebody kills themselves in the unit, whatever the case may be. Don't let your first property purchase be all of your budget. Let those things happen um, on a wider scale portfolio and over time so that you can deal with those uh, unexpected occurrences or mistakes that you've made or whatnot. But definitely get into the market. Don't, don't sit on your, don't sit on your uh, will to invest for years and years and years as some people do, but maybe test yourself with the smaller, cheaper properties. First one. I did that a lot quicker than I thought I would. <laughs> I thought I'd go over time. Any questions? Anything that I can answer for you? Maybe not. Yes? Sorry, I, I have a bunch of questions, but I'm kind of curious, if you buy an entire building, what kind of legal responsibilities are you liable for? Uh, well, tenants have their own insurance policies for their um, personal selves and their personal belongings inside the units. Um, you obviously are legally obliged to make sure that the building is safe for residents, but if there's a fire inside one of the units, it's not your fault. If there's a fire in the entire building, you also have your own insurance policy to cover you for that. So you're legally responsible to maintain the building in livable condition within reason, but as you can see walking around any city in Japan, there's a bunch of buildings that have seen much better days, so it's not like if the building is very old and could potentially come crashing down, um, you have to immediately demolish it and remove it. It's not the case, but it's probably a good idea um, to keep it from falling on people's head. Yeah. Yes. So, regarding your services that you provide, do you, if somebody wants, for example, myself as an investor, um, do I? contact, for example, this lady in the back is a real estate agent, you work in conjunction with the agent, or do you work on your own, you do the due diligence as well, and locate the properties, or how does that work? So, we're not real estate agents, um, or brokers, or realtors, and we have no interest in being, so we come in as an added layer, um, and people hire us in one of two capacities, either to facilitate the entire deal on their behalf, in front of the agent, in front of the property, and then manage the portfolio on their behalf, or if they're comfortable dealing with agents, either in Japanese or in English, and they just want somebody to hold their hand, make sure they're asking the right question. Because agents, um, again, there are exceptions like Mika and Emil, but agents are generally speaking transaction oriented. So they're not going to lie to you, especially in Japan. It's, it's generally speaking, again, I don't know. I've heard other things in Tokyo with overbidding, so maybe there's dodgy agents in Tokyo, I, I'm guessing. but. Usually they're not going to be outright criminal or hide information from you, or, or but they will not necessarily bring out all the caveats that you might have known to ask about. So people often hire us as consultants along the way, and then we just make sure that they avoid these kind of mistakes. Yes. Uh, can you? Can you talk a bit about the financing options for foreigners here in Japan? Um, particularly, I've heard that uh, Tokyo-based banks often don't lend for investment properties outside of the, the Kanto area or, or major metropolitan centers. Um, in some of these kind of second-tier cities that you deal with, what kind of financing options are there? And um, are, are also, are the, are the limits as an individual investor, are they similar to what Emil was talking about before, seven to eight times your total income, or any other conditions like that? 
So, as far as I'm aware, we don't deal very much. I mean, our customers usually buy their properties in cash. Um, I don't know of too many of them that have actually applied for and managed to get an investment loan. And whether that's because of their personal finances or because they're foreigners or because the banks didn't want to lend for that property, I have no idea. But generally speaking, the borrowing capacity, as far as I'm aware, is similar to what Emil was talking about. So your maximum borrowing capacity, whether it's for investment or your home loan, um, is up to approximately 7% of your annual uh, salary. With businesses, it's a little bit different. So I, I have heard, and I think there are some people here in the room who maybe know a bit more about investment loans than I do, but I have heard of businesses being able to borrow beyond that whatever the individual is, is being evaluated on. So that's something to look at. We have seen that local banks are a bit more lenient. So if you're looking for a particular property in a particular area, that listing agent would always have at least one or two bank connections that they already know would qualify this property. So it's usually a better idea, especially if you're out of where your bank is, it's usually a better idea to just ask that listing agent if he can help with, a, with a, organizing the loan for you. But again, when you're getting into rural areas, you really want to have very fluent Japanese because they just freak out at the thought of having to deal with a foreigner in English like anybody else in Japan. So. Oh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I just wanted, you, you mentioned about the rental prices and some of the owner-occupied uh, properties you can trust the, uh, the rental value on the website. How do you make that comparison and do you use some sort of websites to make that comparison? So most of the normal websites that you'd look for when you're looking to uh, buy like a family home or a holiday, so again sumohomes.jp, they would usually have rental sections as well. So you just look for that area, you try to narrow the field down size-wise, distance from station-wise to get as similar to that property and then just see what they're being advertised for in the market. Maybe take that down a notch, because obviously being advertised means they still haven't found a tenant, so maybe 10, 15% less than what they're asking for is probably a reasonable, comparable rental price. Okay, in the chat. And I think we had, after that, we had another question over there, right? Yeah. Okay, from the chat, Robert Miller asks, uh, is it possible to buy a building in cash, renovate, uh, rent higher, then go to a Japanese bank for refinancing, aka getting an equity loan that is higher than the initial purchase price for further property reinvestment. Yeah, so as far as I'm aware, and again, Emil will probably elaborate in the panel, but there is no such thing as drawing on your equity with Japanese loans. The, the loans that you're gonna get are purely evaluated based on your earning capacity, not on the equity that you have in existing properties, unfortunately. Okay, and one more question from the chat. This is kind of a specific situation, but Andreas asks, I have heard before that sellers sometimes team up with financing companies and fail buildings with their own employees, for instance, to run prices up and then on sale all the tenants leave. Is this still a thing or just a horror story nowadays? Have you heard of that? <laughs> so, yes. So, it's... It's not a horror story. It is based in reality. It is quite rare though. So we have purchased, for example, some properties um, that have had, this usually happens, if it happens to us, it usually happens with individual units. We'll buy an individual unit with a tenant in there that seems to have been in place for like 30 years or 20 years or 15 years. And then a month after settlement, they just move out. Whether that's a case of them being in cahoots with the um, sellers or the financiers or what have you, I have no idea, but it can happen. You basically should not be purchasing a property based solely on what it's currently yielding. You should always run comparable, like, like that gentleman was just asking about, always you want to run comparable rentals because you want to assume that the day after you bought the property, all rooms are going to be vacant immediately, right? And then you want to figure out how much you can actually get for them. So it's a great point of entry to know that the property is generating 7-8%, but if the comparable average rent in the area brings it to 3-4%, that's what you should be evaluating the deal on, not the current rent. Thank you. So, so yes, sorry, lady in the back there. Uh, 
Uh, do you know anything about the properties which are sold on auctions? Because uh, there are archaeas, and not only archaeas, but uh, properties which were taken by a tax office and which are sold on auctions. That's uh, usually a very good deal, finance-wise, but there must be some like underwater rocks, which what would you recommend to look for in such case? Like, uh, what can be danger there? So, foreclosure properties, I think that's the ones you're referring to, um, they, they are a thing in Japan. Um, the auction procedure, the way it works in Japan is closed auction, it means you have to submit your offer in a kind of sealed envelope, you're not going to be able to start a bidding, like offer more or less. So you're, generally speaking, you have to evaluate what you think you're comfortable with, submit the offer, maybe get it, maybe not. It's very time consuming, so you will be making offers on multiple, multiple, multiple properties before you actually land one. And the other thing is that a lot of the time you're buying sight unseen. So there might be some information available about the property and you could potentially get, you know, a, a beautiful property that just, you know, the owner ran out of luck, but you could also get a hole in the wall that needs to be completely gutted and renovated and that's going to cost more than three, four times. So it's a mixed bag. I mean, if you're happy with it and you've got some money that you can put aside for these attempts, then it might be worth investing the time and money into it. Um, but there's... From our perspective, we don't deal with it because number one, it's very hands-on involved, and number two, we just we don't like to get cats in the bags for, for our customers. So we would go for something that we can clearly know what the condition of the property is before we purchase it. Um, yeah, can I ask a question? Um, here in the back, yeah, hi. Um, yeah, just regarding buying like an older apartment, like 50 plus years, um, they're obviously a lot cheaper on the websites. But they're in danger of being, you know, bought by developers and getting knocked out. So, are there any circumstances where that could be a good deal? For example, if you buy it cheap, but then it gets redeveloped and you actually end up, could you actually get paid more than what you bought it for, or could you get a discount on whatever is being built subsequently? Yeah, so that's not as much as a viable strategy in Japan as it is in other countries because developers here don't... I mean, if you think about it from a developer's perspective, like um, Blanca was mentioning earlier as well, zoning regulations have changed, so if I've got a five-story building on a certain land plot, a developer buying that one is not no longer going to be able to build a five-story building there. He's going to have to reduce the building size. So they're not going to be making very lucrative offers and offering people, um, in most cases, they're not going to be offering people a unit. So if they bought a 80 unit block and then they can only build 40 units there, they've got 80 unit owners to compensate, they're just not going to do that. So what they do is usually um, they come in with, they either buy one or two or three units in the same building, then they get voting rights on the owner union and then they slowly try to convince everyone to sell at market price at best usually not beyond that so it's not a super viable strategy if you own the entire structure it's a bit different so if you own a small two or three story building in a good location nobody's got any leverage you just make the decision on whether you want to sell it or not so it's more viable in these cases but not not a huge strategy in japan i wouldn't say no Um, if you're aiming for pre-tax yield of 4 to 5 percent, what's the advantage of property over more liquid investments like high yield stocks or bonds? So that is a super high level question. I can tell you what my, why I personally prefer property. Number one, it's something I know and understand so I feel comfortable in it compared to other stuff that I'll have to sit down and study from day one. Um, from what I hear from other people, um, it's insurable. It's a lot more safe and steady in the sense that you don't have to constantly keep your eye on what's happening with the property. Normally speaking, you'll be getting regular rental income on a monthly basis. You have to take care of problems when they occur, but it's, it's very much set and forget when it works well. So it's probably closer to passive income. I'm not a big expert on stock investments and, and equity markets. I do know that there are people who invest set and forget in equity markets as well. I'm just personally more comfortable with the real estate um, and there's like the emotional side of things too. I mean, my dad always said, worst case, you can always live there, right? 
so that, I mean, it's a tangible asset, but I mean, there's also something to be said for diversity, so I would definitely advise to get a little bit of both, diversify either within real estate or within other sectors and other types of investment, there's always room for I don't think there's better or worse, there's just different, different preferences for different investors. question that was asked earlier, if we could slightly change the situation to just owning, fully owning that home, could we take that to a bank for refinancing and then, hold on one second, let me get clarification, get a loan against that fully owned piece of property for another investment property? Um, Emil, can you maybe chime in on this? As far as I know, you can only get the loan again if you've paid off some of it, but Emil knows a lot better than me on that. Yeah, so in general, as an individual, um, so it's very, very common in the West. So that question makes complete sense sort of without that Western mindset. You know, if I've got a million dollar property and half a million is paid off and I only have half a million left to get, I can sort of refinance that and get, you know, $300,000 of equity back out to invest in another project. In Japan, they don't let you do that as an individual. So you kind of, even if you want to refinance say for example for a cheaper interest rate, you can get um, a refinancing at a cheaper rate, but only for the remainder of the loan, plus maybe some, some uh, costs for the title transfer tax and, and what have you, you can't really get all that money back out from the property. And that's why you don't see um, investors, individual investors so much like, like in other countries where Okay, they paid off some of their property and then they use that equity in their property as the 20% down payment for another investment and, and so on and so on. That cycle they don't really do here in Japan. So, no, for individuals, no, they won't do that. But one thing, because um, I know who you're talking about. Um, I have been talking with a, you know, some banks recently about business loans. So if you actually have a corporation established, um, and that they, they assess the business itself as well, this business wants to buy a particular property. What are the financial circumstances of that property? How much is it going to be paying? How much money does that business have? Okay, and even if that owner contributes, say, you know, 10 million yen, 50 million yen, okay, and says, that can be a just funds for the business, I'm not going to request it back. Then the, the bank knows, all right, the property is going to bring back this much, the company has this much financing. Um, so let's assess it completely as a business venture, not as an individual trying to do it. Even, even, even then the in, individual's income no longer plays a big part. They assess it just as a business venture in itself. And that's, I think, one of the strategies that, um, you know, I know who's asking the questions because he messaged me before. The, the next step of sort of discussion I want to have with him in particular, um, yeah, because I have been inquiring about financing, but traditionally as an individual, trying to play that, that um, route with Japanese banks is not, is not a realistic option. Yes, was it? That will be a separate loan. So you don't, you don't only draw down on the loan. Yeah, it, it will be a, a reform loan. Yeah. I uh, got a question on rental property. So, what is the timeline that to evict someone if you have a deadbeat tenant and they're not paying? I've heard horror stories to where. They have a lot of legal rights and they can drag it on indefinitely. So if somebody's deadbeat, what from the time that they don't pay until they're actually out of the building, what, what, what are we looking at as far as time? So in Japan, in our experience at least, that's not a huge issue. I mean, obviously there are deadbeat tenants, but if they don't pay for a month or two or three, you send them a letter and off they go kind of thing. They're not gonna drag you to court. Or there's no forced, not much, at least not that I've seen any forced evictions or 
squatters or anything. They do have the legal rights, potentially, if they keep paying to stay in the property forever, but once they stop paying, it's a fairly easy process. It's usually a letter and off they go. So it's not legal conflict between tenants and landlords is quite rare in Japan. If you've got foreign tenants, that's a totally different matter, but yeah, with your typical Japanese tenants, no, not, not much of an issue. Yep. Oh, hi. Um, I've got a question about uh, ownership. Um, in, in Australia, where, where I came from, uh, there is this family trust thing. Um, yeah, in, in Japan, is, is that a thing? Um, and how likely, uh, I mean, like, obviously, um, if I have a family trust, I would actually assign my kids into the trust as well. So when I die, I, sort of, I, I can sort of pass, up, pass it on to my kids. Um, and then, you know, obviously for tax avoidance, inheriting tax uh, purpose. And um, yeah, I'm just wondering if that's a thing in Japan or not really, and how likely is that going to affect your loan uh, capacity? So loan capacity, again, not my forte, but the SMSF that you used to from Australia, um, at least until recently, was not a recognized structure in Japan. So properties need to be owned either by individuals or by incorporated entities. So NPOs, family funds, self-managed, whatever, don't qualify for property ownership. You can have um, a company inside the fund, if you're talking about the fund uh, set up like in Australia or overseas, you can have a company inside owned by the fund and then the company can own property. So that's not an issue. In Japan, I don't think is ni as um, Nisa and Ideco, are, do they enable you to hold properties? Or? Right, they're not for that purpose, right? So no, it's it's not a structure that's recognized or or exists in Japan, as far as I'm aware now. Hi, uh, just wondering what your thoughts are in terms of portfolio uh, composition. Would it be like how would you advise a client if he's uh, trying to decide between say three or four or five smaller properties versus one building? Uh, or one small building. Like what are the pros and cons there? Um, yeah. So, I would, generally speaking, advise somebody who has the bad budget, but not only the budget, but also the cash flow budget to handle the more unexpected nature of a building investment. If they can, I would advise them to go for a building investment simply because they get a larger land plot with the property, and land obviously is the only thing that might hold or gain value in Japan. It's never going to be the structure. So, you, but you do need to keep in mind that 10% that or 20% or whatever it is, the building fees that are being charged don't exist. You need to make sure that you have a buffer of 10 or 20% of your annual rental income, whatever it may be, to maintain the building because when the roof goes, it's all on you. There's nobody else. But if you're looking, it really depends on the customer's risk appetites. And we always like to ask them what other investments they have, whether it's real estate investments, whether in Japan or overseas, just to get an idea of um, what their risk tolerance is and how, um, how safe and stable or how adventurous and high yield their current portfolio is. Um, the individual units are definitely there are far less surprises with them. So you know exactly how much you're getting every month, you know exactly how much you're paying in fees every month, and generally speaking, except the occasional interior renovation, when a tenant moves out, there's not much that you need to worry about. With a building, you could potentially get higher yields, and you obviously have the flexibility of doing more things with the units than if you have an owner you need to consider, and the larger land plot, um, but it comes with less stability. So you do need to be aware of the fact that things will happen and you will need to fix them, otherwise your income will cease, right? So uh, I would, generally speaking, advise to go for a building if you can afford it. Um, but yeah, if again, if it's your entire life savings, I'd get, I'd maybe put a 50% of your entire life savings into individual units. I wouldn't worry about getting too adventurous. Online, Miss Okoli asks, uh, would you be able to raise rents every year like in other countries here? Absolutely not. <laughs> right. It's right. not done. <laughs> oh, so, no. so Japan, um, as everyone who lives here and most people overseas are aware, Japan, I mean, 
mean, we had a good run since late 2012 until now, even during COVID, you know, compared to other countries, we've done relatively well here. Um, but Japan has had 25 years of deflation from the 1990s until 2012, and we've only started recently to creep out of that. We're seeing property prices in more speculative locations that are internationally hot, like Tokyo, Central Osaka, Niseko. Property prices are getting to the point of pre-bubble days, but um, the rent amounts, the salaries, the cost of living, everything is still half or close to half what it was in the early 90s. We certainly have not been able to raise rents um, in super, super central locations that are highly coveted, yes, but slightly, maybe 10%. Um, but again, it's not every year. It's once a tenant moves out and the new tenant moves in, you could potentially list the property for slightly higher. In most cases, they've remained exactly the same or dropped if there's too much demand, in, uh, too much supply in the area. So until Japan's economy makes a major U-turn somehow, I wouldn't expect to be able to raise rents now. And short-term stays are a whole different thing, but we'll let Tracy riff on that. Yep. So regarding tax liability, if I'm buying an investment property here um, and I'm getting residual income, what's my tax liability if I'm buying it as a foreign entity? Am I liable for tax here or only in my own home country? So yes, you're always liable for tax here. Japan has a tax treaty with most countries, as far as I'm aware, so you're not going to be double taxed. So you first off pay your taxes here, or you at least submit your tax return to show that you don't owe any taxes. Then you take that back to the tax department in your country of residence, and you pay the difference, if any. But it always gets uh, taxed here first. As a corporate uh, entity owning property, the tax is capped. So it starts at about 20, 20 something percent. So you're not going to get the cheap, cheap, cheap or no tax that you'd get as an individual. But if your portfolio is going to be, let's say, half a million and over, half a million dollars and over, it's worth looking at corporate ownership because A, the tax is capped, and B, there's a lot more than you can claim. Um, but again, same, same thing applies. You would first pay your tax here and then yeah, get taxed on the difference back home. As a building owner, uh, what uh, is the relationship with the homeowners association or whatever it is here in Japan? And then what liabilities do you have or what access do you have to the reserve funds uh, that are held by the organization? As a unit owner? As a building building owner. So if, if there's an owner union, you're not the building owner, they own individual units. So what do you mean? I don't understand. So if you buy an entire building, you don't... There's no owner union, it's just you. So, there, so imagine there was an existing homeowners association. They get cancelled out if you buy the building because now there's a single owner. There's no need for a union anymore. And if there's if there are reserve funds for maintenance or whatever, you get all of that money. Uh, I would assume so because that uh, we haven't had a case of buying. We usually the buildings that we help customers buy are much smaller than the ones you're talking about. So it's going to go from single owner to single owner. But those funds have been put aside for maintenance and renovations of the building, so there's no reason for anybody to be able to withdraw them. The only cases I know where people do withdraw the reserve funds is natural disaster or they decide to demolish the building for any reason. They pay the demolition and removal out of the reserve funds and then the remainder gets distributed between the unit owners, but that's only because there's no more building there. As long as the building is there, that money needs to go towards renovation and repair of the building. And when you purchase, you would also want to see that, right? Otherwise you suddenly going to have to fork out 50 million yen for something. It, that, that money is supposed to go to the new owner, whoever that is. Single owner. So it, it can't just be stolen and then run away with the money. You have to redistribute it back to all the owners if, if you buy them out or if you, or I guess if you, if you want to demolish the building, for example. If you buy the building from the existing owners, it's same as um, security deposits for tenants or anything else that you might need to use. So if you're buying the building from existing owners, you're supposed to get the reserve funds that have been accumulated. There have been cases of embezzlement. There have been owner union heads who have stolen money from the reserve funds or, you know, just cronied, you know, various renovation repair companies that got far more money than they needed to get. But 
With ownership transfer, the reserve funds, as far as I'm aware, I checked that with a lawyer, but as far as I'm aware, the reserve funds go to the new owners. It's part of the building's assets, if you want. I mean, people have put that money into the building because it's going to be a renovation in the future. If they then decided to sell, I believe that the buyer still needs to have access to those funds because they're part of the renovation plan and they're part of the held assets. But that is something that I haven't had experience with personally, so I would check with a lawyer. And do we have a lawyer in the house, by the way? Anybody with understanding in real estate? No? No. So. And that, that, that association, I presume, is like a president and there's like a whole pol internal politics and personalities. Yet how much do you have to deal with that? It depends on the size of the building, but yes, that is often the case. There's usually a rotating uh, head of the owner union that's supposed to change over every three to five years. Um, the politics, I mean, yes, they exist, but when you buy the entire thing again, they get dissolved, so it shouldn't be an issue. I I'm sorry, but we're going to have to cut it because I'm way, way over time. But thank you.